So the benefits from using pesticides to reduce pest populations and reducing infectious diseases to humans and animals and increase crop yields are, of course, some of the main goals of, of why pesticides exist. And so ideally, we would want to uh, maximize the potential benefits of pesticides while minimizing the risks. So the whole concept of risk is uh, risk equals exposure and toxicity. So if toxicity is low, but risk for exposure is high, or uh, the chance of exposure is high, then that can still create um, a high risk uh, type of situation. And the way that I like to kind of give an analogy here with this um, exposure and toxicity concept is think about when you go to the gas station and get fuel for your car, get gas for your car. Um, uh, gasoline is very toxic and carries a lot of inherent risks with it. Uh, but it's been designed both by car manufacturers and by the, the gas station uh, pump technology. It's designed to where um, the risk of exposure or our, our exposure likelihood to those products is really low because the nozzles fit in very tightly. There's barriers to help prevent you from getting splashed or sprayed. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's it, that system is designed to reduce exposure to a very toxic substance and thereby reduce the risk of its use. So pesticide labels have signal words on them that indicate toxicity. And so they kind of go in order of um, caution being the lowest amount of toxicity. So if pesticide label says caution, those are, those are uh, lower toxicity products. And they typically, that typically refers to anywhere from an ounce to more than one pint of the active ingredient or that concentrate to um, cause, to cause harm. Uh, the next level is a, the warning um, phrase and it has mid toxicity. And then there's, that's a teaspoon to a tablespoon typically, and then danger, which is high toxicity. And this is a taste to a teaspoonful. And then there, there's actually even kind of one above that, and, it, and it's a signal word that says danger poison. And those are products that will also have a skull and crossbones on them. And those are extremely high toxicities, and those are typically only available um, as a reduced or as a restricted use product or a restricted product. And, and you have to have um, a certain type of license to be able to get those, and you can only get those from certain vendors. So um, the general use for general use, uh, this is the labels that you're going to find most likely in, in the various areas in the garden centers, as most garden centers do, um, don't carry um, restricted use pesticides. So some of the common formulations are uh, ready to use products, and uh, that would actually include the, what's shown in the picture here, which is diatomaceous earth. Uh, it comes as a ready to use product. You can also find lots of uh, ready to use uh, things like um, insecticidal soaps, you can find ready to use herbicides, which basically just mean that you, you go right out and you can spray it on the weeds in your lawn and you don't have to mix it with any water or with any other carrier. Uh, aerosols are another popular one. These are, these would be the, what we would typically call bug bombs. So um, it also includes things like wasp and hornet sprays, those kinds of things uh, where, where they're designed to be ejected out of out of some sort of pressurized container. Uh, then there's concentrates. Uh, most of the liquid pesticides are going to be concentrated uh, ex with, the, with the main exception of ready to use. So they're, they're either concentrated or, or they're ready to use. And then there's granules, dust and powders and baits. And baits are designed to be uh, consumed by a target organism. And uh, so care must be taken with those to prevent other organisms from consuming those that aren't part of that um, target group. All right, so uh, pesticides can be sprayed in a number of different ways or applied, excuse me, in a number of different ways. They can be applied through sprayers, which is one of the most common methods. And those can be hose-in sprayers, which is a, a nozzle with a concentrate tank that usually goes on the end of a hose. And then the water sprays out the hose and the concentrate is mixed into the water as it flows through it. Then there's backpack and canister sprayers. And this backpack sprayer is pictured here. These typically hold one to three gallons of uh, diluted product. And 
then you can walk around and you pump the little arm on the side and, and so that you can cover a much bigger area with those. And then um, spreaders, which includes things like uh, fertilizer spreaders. Uh, those, kind of, those are also often used for pesticide spreaders, especially when you look at um, things like grub uh, control products for lawns and uh, pre-emergent products for, for lawns and gardens. So crabgrass preventers and, and so on. One of the important concepts to remember about um, applica application and application equipment is understanding what calibration is. And um, calibration is basically the concept of knowing uh, how much your sprayer is putting out or how much your spreader or whatever you're using to apply the product is, is, is how much of that is being put out at a specific time or a specific rate. So, um, if the label says you need to apply, uh, you know, one, one hundred gallons of a product per acre, or you need to apply one pint of this product per thousand square feet, uh, you need to be able to know how much, how big, first of all, how big a thousand square feet is. And then, and secondly, um, how, how fast do you have to walk? How big of a nozzle do you have to use? All those kinds of concepts to put out, um, say one pint of this product per thousand square feet. So it's basically then just figuring out how much to apply um, per area and then knowing, knowing do you actually apply that amount. <clears throat> so one of the most important things about labels, we're going to spend just a few minutes talking about what's on the label, because I think that almost all of the questions that we get at the extension offices and the problems that we deal with in the public uh, can be answered by proper uh, reading and understanding of what's on the labels of pesticides. So one of the uh, very important things that's going to be found on the pesticide label is the requirements for the personal protective equipment or the PPE. So um, usually the PPE that's going to be generic or the general PPE for, for pretty much all products that have to be labeled uh, with this is going to be a long sleeve shirt and long pants, uh, shoes and rubber or rubber boots uh, and rubber gloves. And then depending on the type of product that it is, goggles and respirators and additional uh, uh, per personal protective equipment may also be required by the label. So uh, these requirements are, are, are there to help reduce the risk of exposure. Uh, in general, uh, as I've kind of alluded to, homeowner pesticides don't require special protective equipment. And that's why I kind of was saying, typically they're all, they're, they're mostly going to say long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes and rubber boots and rubber gloves. Um, <clears throat> but you can always use more um, PPE than the label requires. That's obviously not going to be against the law. So uh, for additional protection, we also recommend wearing rubber gloves. And they, this, these aren't the nitrile gloves. These are actually thick uh, rubber gloves that are designed for um, pesticide application. So um, rubber exam gloves, uh, the blue nitrile gloves, those aren't actually uh, a significant of enough barrier um, to really qualify as PPE um, to meet pesticide labeling um, com compliance. So. Um, and, and also a wide brim hat and, and goggles or something to protect the eyes. So more toxic products are going to require more stuff like waterproof boots, respirators, face masks, uh, or even a full body suit. And, and I experience wearing full body suits in, in large greenhouse application of pesticides and it. it's not fun, but it was necessary to keep us safe. And then remember that, um, when, after using and mixing products, you, you need to wash your hands and face thoroughly with detergent uh, or soap and water and uh, also do that before you um, go to the bathroom. So, so <clears throat> pesticide users are required by law to comply with all the instructions and directions for use in pesticide labeling. So in other words, the label is the law and it's the only way that the manufacturers have to communicate with the end users. So as employees and people and all of us that recommend products they recommend products to people as they come into to the stores or come into our offices. We, we have to be careful here because the label is 
what they have to follow. They have to legally comply with the label. We can get into a little bit of trouble by recommending something that, that, that they might follow in, instead of reading the label. They're, they're still liable in the sense that they should have read the label, but we need to be careful in providing a lot of, of other information, uh, especially when we're really not sure what the label says. So when in doubt, always refer people to the label itself on the package that they're considering purchasing. And they can, a lot of those labels are, are ones that you can actually open up and unfold so that they can be read. And um, they actually should be perused carefully before um, purchase of pesticides is actually um, completed. So pesticides are a highly regulated product. Um, they're regulated uh, federally by the Environmental Protection Agency and they're, they're regulated uh, in the state of Utah by the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. The label has information on safe usage and storage. And as I said before, and I will stress this several times, is that the user is responsible for all information on the label. Uh, we just need to be careful that we're not misleading the user and, and giving them conflicting information uh, so that they may not understand or be in doubt about what the label says. So um, the EPA has about um, 21,000 registered pesticide products. And they're, and they're formulated from over uh, 1,300 active ingredients. And there's uh, just about 500 companies that distribute um, about 17, uh, or about 500 companies that manufacture products and about uh, 17,000 companies that distribute pesticide products. So there's a lot of stuff out there and it becomes even more uh, kind of emphasize that we need to be making sure that we understand and that, that the people that we're co communicating with and trying to advise that we understand and read the labels because that's where the liability is gonna come from is not following the label. So what's on the label? Basically um, the labels include the name of the product, the pesticide type, and that includes uh, things like whether it's a fungicide, uh, an herbicide or an insecticide or uh, a molluscicide, you know, if it kills snails or whatever. It also has the ingredients. So the ingredient statement uh, can be somewhat complex um, to look at because pesticides have complex chemical names, uh, but they're usually uh, also containing shorter, uh, more common names for easier identification. So, so something like 2,4-D or something like that, rather than its, its full name. Uh, and so those are the active ingredients. So they're also going to be signal words and symbols as we've talked about before. And so what I've got this picture of right here is this is the danger poison label that I mentioned. This is the highly toxic pesticides that uh, are only available by, uh, or they're a restricted use product. Uh, and so that's, again, those signal words can give you some sort of indication as to how toxic those are if they're, if they're ingested. Then precautionary statements. Um, these are statements re regarding certain precautions that should be taken in order to protect people, including the applicator uh, and off-target um, sites um, against pesticide exposure. Then there's directions for use. This is where most of us go right to that is like, well, how, how much of this do I need to use for mixing it up for my lawn and those kinds of things. So it's a violation of federal law to use um, these products in a manner inconsistent with this labeling. Again, we have to follow the label. Um, the directions for use include the pests that it may control, um, the crops, uh, animals, other locations where it can be used, how it should be applied, how much to use, and where or when the material should be applied. So this, this is the main part of the label that most of us are going to, to go to uh, for most of the information. But they also contain first aid information, which um, is, isn't, doesn't seem important until we need it. Um, but the emergency information is given on what to do in case of, of accidental exposure. So this is an example of a typical pesticide label. Um, the first thing that you notice here is the brand name and the manufacturer. Uh, so this is a Dow AgroSciences Conserve SC. Now the SC in this um, particular case is an abbreviation for uh, suspension concentrate. So uh, if you read through the rest of the label on this, it actually states in, in the directions for use 
that you must keep this product agitated at all times. Otherwise, the active ingredient settles to the bottom because it's a suspension. It's not a solution. It doesn't dissolve. It just stays suspended. Um, so um, this product is a registered insecticide for turf and ornamental plants. And there is a list of, you can see here, uh, there's a list. Get the highlight out. Uh, let's see, laser point. So you can see here, there's a list of insects that it controls. And uh, there is also the common and the chemical name. So the active ingredient in this is spinosad. And then it breaks it down a little further saying it includes spinosin A and spinosin D. And that's actually where the name spinosad comes from is a combination of spinosad A and D. So uh, we also have the EPA registration number. Uh, in this case, uh, is shown here, and patent numbers, of course, will be there as well. Uh, but the EPA registration number is is the number that is assigned to this particular product with this particular label uh, by the EPA, and it has to accompany all all of the uh, communication for this particular product. So every every different product will have its own EPA registration number. It's usually also near the storage and disposal section and, and pay, pay close attention to this as well. Uh, it talks about how it should be stored and you know it's, it's important to understand a lot of these labels are gonna say that they, these products can't be frozen, uh, they can't be too hot, um, they, they need to be stored in a ventilated area and those kinds of things. Pesticide disposal becomes an issue uh, at landfills and uh, there are, there are a lot of old products that haven't been uh, used that are just accumulating and, and those are also potentially very problematic. Um, so in, on any given label, it will usually tell you how you need to try and, and dispose of the pesticide. I will just say that the, the, the easiest and most legal way to comply with pesticide disposal is simply to use the product up. So for example, if you've got a bunch of Roundup in a shed, and, and the shed froze or it got cold and the Roundup froze during the winter, uh, chances are the Roundup is, is not going to be uh, very effective at controlling weeds anymore because Roundup is, the active ingredient is very uh, sensitive to freezing temperatures. So what's the best way to dispose of the Roundup? It, it's actually still the best way is to actually spray it and use it as if the product, as the product was intended uh, just knowing that it's probably not going to work very well. So, but but at least you're following and complying with the label, and so uh, you're minimizing uh, any potential environmental uh, risks. The other thing is you could take it to a to a disposal site that that's either operated by a county or or a city, uh, which sometimes are in conjunction with landfills, but. Do, don't put these things in, in the garbage cans when they haven't been properly disposed of. And then most of them are gonna say the containers need to be uh, triple rinsed or equivalent, which for us, triple rinsing means filling the container uh, to at least 20% of its original volume with water, um, shaking it and then dumping it out, uh, or well, not dumping it out, but actually putting it into a spray tank and spraying it out. Uh, and I, so what I like to do with these is actually uh, take the rinse aid it's called and um, put it into the tank that I'm mixing up. So if I'm mixing up Roundup and I've used the last of the container, um, I'll add the water, uh, shake it, uh, and then um, pour that solution into my, into my spray tank and use that as part of what I'm diluting the concentrate with. So I do that three times and then puncture and um, dispose of the container. Usually you can just do that through, through the trash pickup. It's a good idea also to puncture the container so they can't be used for anything else. I've seen this a lot where we see pesticides that are put in things like soda bottles and, and other things like that. And that, that can lead to uh, confusion and, and uh, poisonings that way. So the labels also have environmental hazards. Um, a lot of times they're gonna say uh, things like this product is highly toxic to bees or highly toxic to fish uh, or do not apply where runoff is likely to occur. Um, this particular product is a restricted use um, product, which means that the individual has to have a special license to, in, in order to get it. 
And then in addition to the EPA uh, registration number, number, there's also manufacturer information about who actually manufactured um, that product. All right, so <clears throat> as we drill down a little bit, um, we have first aid uh, or statements of practical treatment is ba basically a fancy way of saying the first aid uh, measures and what types of exposure require uh, medical attention. This is the most important information. If a physician is called or poison control is called, uh, this is the most important information um, that needs to be communicated to, the, to those people. Um, so without the label, the physician has really no information for treatment, at least uh, not readily available. The precautionary statements, uh, that is basically how it can harm um, people and uh, the animals that we live with typically. And uh, it gives information on how to avoid poisonings and the PPE or the personal protective equipment needed. The directions for use label, as I mentioned, or part of the label is where a lot of us are going to go to first and say, well, how do I use this product? It gives all the mixing directions, including how much you need to use per given area. Um, and uh, in this area, it will, it will state that it may be permissible to use the product at rates lower than specified. Uh, it may also indicate if there's a pre-harvest interval as part of the directions for use. We run into this all the time. It's like people come in and they want to know what they can spray on their peach trees or their apple trees. And so they might select a product, but they don't observe the time at which uh, they can safely consume the product after it's been sprayed for codling moth or, or for something else. So make sure that those kinds of things are understood and what, what they mean is that the time required between the last application and the harvesting of the crop for safe consumption or when the residue levels uh, are deemed safe um, for consumption. So um, that's, that's also uh, very important. So there are a few exceptions to the label that I thought I would just mention here and I need to keep an eye on my time. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's worthy to just kind of note these. So as I've said, the label is the law and we have to, we're, we have, we're supposed to follow it to the, to the T. Um, but exceptions include, you can use more personal protective equipment than required, makes sense. Uh, you can use the pesticide at a lower dosage concentration or frequency than listed on the label. You don't have to follow it exactly. But I will throw out a word of caution here on these, that um, using a pesticide at a lower dosage concentration or frequency may result in unsatisfactory pest management for that, for that particular pest. And it can actually uh, increase the potential for pesticide resistance. Um, be, uh, so we might think that we're doing the environment a favor or that we're helping ourselves out, but in reality, uh, sometimes doing this may not actually be the best long-term approach. So just uh, kind of use that with caution. Um, you can also mix the pesticide uh, with fertilizers unless it's specifically prohibited on the label. And of course, with some pesticides that, that may not uh, even be practical or wouldn't even make sense. But, but for example, you, you, could, you could mix uh, an herbicide with a fertilizer, for example, which is, which, um, is often done, but uh, unless the label specifically prohibits it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea and you would want to have somebody actually do a, do a sample test or mix up a small amount and see if the products are compatible with each other and don't cause a chemical reaction and make a brick inside the bottom of your spray tank or something. Um, and you can also mix different pesticides together if you're using them at the recommended rates. And again, this is one where you wanna you add them together and test for compatibility. So a lot of labels will say, Two, that if you're going to mix it with other products, here's the order at which you need to mix them. So if you're mixing any powdered or dry products, uh, they need to go in a certain order. If, you, if you've got um, like suspension solutions or emulsifiable concentrates or dry flowables or any of those, um, it, they'll usually say the order at which they need to go in the tank to help maximize um, their compatibility. The big exception here to the label is that um, you can apply the pesticide against any pest who's not listed on the label if the application is to a site that is listed. So in other words, application to the site not on the label is illegal. So uh, you, might, you might have a garden and, and a pest that is not necessarily on a product that you have that's labeled uh, for garden use or say for homeowner uh, outdoor use. 
Um, uh, you may not have all the pests that you're dealing with may not be listed on the label, but it's, it's actually still legal to apply that product as long as the application site is listed on the label. So as we'll probably come up later in this little presentation, um, it's still not a good idea to just apply pesticides, even though the site in, is there and it's on the label and it might not be illegal, it still may not help with pest, the pest management, um, especially if we don't understand the pests that we're actually trying to control. So then that's actually the first step in pest management is really uh, identify the pests that you're trying to, con that you need to control. So other details here, um, just about done uh, with this portion, is that the label uh, will state again, the pests controlled, uh, the pre-harvest intervals or the amount of time that must elapse from when the product is sprayed on a crop um, before that crop can be harvested or consumed and it will be um, safe to do so. Now, it may also say the maximum applications per year uh, there's quite a few uh, fruit tree sprays, for example, that have a maximum amount of applications per year. And uh, the label will also state temperature restrictions. And this is one that, that uh, we deal with a lot. So I took a sample here um, from the label of Trimec Turf Ester, a broadleaf herbicide. And if we look down here uh, at the bottom of this statement, it says, do not apply to newly seeded grasses until well established. Do not spray when air temperatures exceed 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, so we see a lot of problems, collateral damage of people uh, from people applying uh, broadleaf herbicides in the summer when temperatures exceed 85 degrees. And then these products um, basically vaporize or it's called volatilization. And they uh, move directly from being a solid on the, the grass surfaces, for example, moving right into the air and then moving on air currents. And we see uh, lots of damage in, in off target landscapes and off target crops and uh, homeowners uh, and other applicators have been held liable for those kind, that kind of collateral damage. So um, keep records, follow the label, and uh, you'll, you'll be on the safest grounds possible for using these products. So one other last note here is that um, we have seen, uh, at least in um, Utah County, specific problems related to the Tordon herbicide. Um, <laughs> we, I just kind of say don't recommend Tordon to homeowners. Uh, Tordon shouldn't shouldn't be used. Uh, and JD's going to kind of follow up with this um, with herbicides, use of herbicides, and how they correspond to a lot of plant problems that we see. Uh, but but Tordon is a very powerful um, broadleaf herbicide, and uh, I know that uh, it gets promoted at, at garden centers and and retail establishments um, for the control of, of trees and, and other hard to control kind of brush and, and things. But it's really important to note that this particular product, um, if it's applied to those, even if it's just applied to the stumps, actually has the tendency to leak out of the roots of the, the plant that it was applied to. And then it becomes available for neighboring plants to pick it up. And so if there's you know trees in the area, um, and tree roots will spread a long ways. It's it's really important to, to know that you you really can't use these products in in uh, the home landscape situation where plants and and uh, neighbor neighbors plants are typically really close together. So it just causes a lot of problems, and it's just just not recommended to do that. Uh, <clears throat> and then um, just a word, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was just going to um, say just a quick word about organic pesticides. Um, the USDA, or the Department of Agriculture, develops regulations on um, organic pesticides and the US Department of Agriculture um, regulates that industry and, and defines it. Organic pesticides are derived from natural sources um, and so they can be microbial, they can be botanical, and they can be mineral based. But it's important to understand that organic doesn't mean non-toxic. So um, organic pesticide terminology can be confusing and in some cases counterintuitive. Um, to a lot of people, organic means not using any synthetic fertilizer or any type of pesticide, but there's lots of naturally occurring products classified as pesticides because they kill a pest. And um, they, can, they can be classified as organic, which just simply means that the U.S. Department of Agriculture allows their use in 
certified organic farming operations. So for example, uh, a good example, this is pyrethrin as a botanical insecticide. Um, it's, it's derived from a type of chrysanthemum and is used against a wide range of insects. Um, and it's, it's super, super toxic to, to people and, and animals. Um, for a microbial example, um, BT or Bacillus thuringiensis uh, that acts as a gut poison in certain insects, particularly those in the butterfly and moth and fly group uh, are called lepidopterans. Uh, and then mineral pesticides like lime sulfur, which has been used for hundreds of years to control fungal diseases on a wide variety of crops or um, an oil, a suffocating oil or a horticultural oil, which is designed to suffocate pests and their eggs. Uh, and then also insecticidal soaps, which are quite effective on soft bodied insects as it causes them to dry out. So another misconception is that organic might mean safe and uh, don't make the mistake of just thinking that because a pesticide is organic, it isn't toxic. So I, I see that all the time and it just, it, it makes me cringe because organic doesn't mean non-toxic and it also, and organic production doesn't, doesn't mean that lots of pesticides weren't actually used. So organic pesticides carry the same precautions and signal words as other pesticides. Oops. <clears throat> and uh, they need to be treated as, as such because they are, they are designed to kill things. So um, let's see. In summary then, pesticides are a broad category of chemicals that are designed to kill things. There's lots of different formulations and application methods. Uh, if you, the most important thing I think to take away from this uh, little portion that I have in this, in this class is to always read the entire label before applying pesticides. And I actually recommend that you read the entire label at least five times. They, the entire label should be read before purchasing and then before applying and then um, before disposing. And it should, should be read each time that it's applied as well. Uh, wear the appropriate protective equipment to reduce risk. And remember that both synthetic and quote, organic pesticides are all toxic uh, as they're designed to kill something. So, and that's it for my portion. So I'll stop sharing and then um, can field any questions.